From Indianapolis, with an eye on every corner of the state, this is IBJ Media's Inside Indiana Business with Gary Dick. Presented by Elevate Ventures, Ice Miller, and Indiana University. Eli Lilly going into the new year with big momentum. Lilly CEO Dave Ricks joins us with a look back at what drove success in 2022 and what's in store for this year. Plus, Indiana's emerging role in global health care. At Omniviz, we see that proactive disease detection advances the health of communities and cultivates a safer world for future generations. And take a look at the biggest plane on planet Earth. Indiana's new role in powering it and more hypersonic flight. Hello and welcome to Inside Indiana Business. I'm Gary Dick. Eli Lilly and Company, an Indiana business juggernaut riding a wave of momentum into 2023. A bullish outlook that includes a robust pipeline of medicines designed to help those suffering from everything from leukemia to diabetes, psoriasis, asthma, and obesity. There are suggestions this could be, quote, an unprecedented year for Lilly with the prospect for double digit growth that could extend through the end of the decade. Now, Lilly also expanding its manufacturing footprint in a big way in North Carolina and right here in central Indiana. The company planning a $2.1 billion manufacturing campus on this plot of land in Boone County. Lilly, the first major company to commit to anchoring the Leap District in Lebanon. For more now on what's shaping up to be a big year for Lilly, potentially, pleased to be joined by CEO Dave Ricks, who joins us from Lilly's corporate headquarters in downtown uh, Indianapolis. Dave, thanks for joining us. Great to be with you, Gary. Well, as I said, uh, seemingly tailwinds heading into 2023, um, planning to launch four drugs, five more molecules in that longer term uh, pipeline as well. Company forecast, it was talked about late in the year, talked about double di or mid-teens growth for 2023, that continuing uh, for a number of years. I know you'll be releasing earnings, I think, in the week ahead, so are somewhat limited in what you can say, but uh, the, the signs would seem to point to a bullish 2023 for Lilly. Well, we think so. Uh, we, we did have a chance at the end of December to give an outlook to investors on the year you're citing some of those that we would have mid-teens growth with really a portfolio of very new products. As uh, many of your listeners know, in our business, it's all about what you invented lately and can it grow and drive uh, the top line. And we're in a privileged position in that way because we have been very successful in the last five or six years launching new medicines. And we are poised, as you mentioned in the intro there, to launch uh, four more in the next 12 months, having just launched maybe one of the most important products in our history uh, called Monjaro for diabetes just late last year. So um, the product ramp continues for us. And as you also mentioned, it's a year of investment for the company. We're investing in those launches. We're investing in the next wave of, of uh, innovation that's just starting what we call phase three or late stage studies. And we're investing in manufacturing and really a, 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 a way we've never have done before. We've got five new sites uh, being built, two here in Indiana, as, as you mentioned. So really an exciting and important execution year for the company. I want to talk about that uh, manufacturing uh, expansion in a moment. But first, uh, the Alzheimer's, uh, the potential blockbuster, Donatamab, uh, the FDA just recently uh, turned down uh, the application for early approval. Uh, do you anticipate that's anything more than a, than a speed bump regarding that, uh, again, potential blockbuster? Well, we're obviously disappointed in that because the program they have for early approval is to approve drugs on more limited data. We had submitted that last year, but not shocked by the decision. Uh, the FDA has been under quite a bit of criticism about this pathway. And um, by nature, these submissions are a little bit incomplete. Uh, in our case, they cited one particular issue, which is we didn't have um, very many people who had experienced the drug for more than 12 months. That's a, we see that as a feature, not a bug. Um, the feature is this drug, uh, unlike other approaches to Alzheimer's treatment, you would only take for uh, till your plaque in your brain is clear. Uh, so many patients had that plaque cleared as early as six months. We didn't have the same exposure rate we would normally have for a drug like this. That said, there's a much larger study going on now. It's about to wrap up in the first half of this year, and that'll form the basis of the full submission. Um, so I think it, it is a, uh, hopefully just a, a blip on the way to a very successful uh, product there. Uh, 
Um, and we've got, of course, broad plans in the area of Alzheimer's. Well, you talked about major investment uh, in uh, manufacturing operations. Just uh, a matter of days ago, $450 million uh, expansion announcement at Research Triangle uh, Park in, in North Carolina. But the big headline uh, here in Indiana, certainly in recent months, has been uh, your plans for the Leap Innovation Park in Lebanon, Boone County, just northwest of Indianapolis, $2.1 billion investment, two manufacturing operations there, 500 jobs. Dave, can you give us a picture? Some of the reporting has come out recently talking about 12 buildings, but what this 600 acre or so site, what this will, will look like. Yeah, it's an exciting move for us. And you mentioned the North Carolina presence, which is growing um, both in Concord and in uh, Research Triangle. And then we also had announced a new site in Limerick, Ireland. The Indiana site here in Lebanon is actually two different production sites on one location. Uh, one of those will be uh, really a um, uh, active pharmaceutical ingredient production site for protein therapeutics and some of our newer technologies um, using RNA uh, to, to make medicines. That will be the bigger part of it. And in addition, we'll also have a biotechnology site there really focused on gene therapy production. Um, this site will be um, really adjacent to the whole LEAP project, which we're excited about, the idea of forming a, a production cluster and what um, I know you had the, the president of Purdue, the new president on the so-called hard tech corridor, which we see as a real strength of the state. Purdue on one end, the city of Indianapolis and the logistics powerhouse that we have around Indianapolis, and then right in between the LEAP district where we can um, have a really a high tech and biotech manufacturing center for the state. We want to be a part of that. There's a lot of benefits to clustering. And um, this will be our largest uh, site in the whole Lilly network. So it's a, it's a big uh, operation for us. We hope to get shovels in the ground here soon and, and get going with that, uh, that ramp up. Yeah, you mentioned Meng Chang, Purdue's new, new president. He has a very clear vision uh, of what he sees and Lilly being a part of that. Uh, we had him on the show two, two weeks ago. Here's what he had to say. So there's about 63 miles, it's a straight line, and it's gonna be a hard tech corridor, hard tech as in technology that you can touch. It could be semiconductors, it could be ag, biopharma manufacturing, it could be uh, transportation, logistics, and aerospace. And this 63 mile stretch, including Governor Holcomb and Secretary Chambers' visionary lead districts in Lebanon, right in the middle of this stretch, is gonna redefine not only our state, but the whole Midwest. I don't know if you could hear that that sound right there, Dave. But basically, what you had yeah. just said—that that, I watched it earlier. So yeah, yeah, yeah. He really, he really uh, sees that uh, as real potential. Hey, before before uh, I let you go, I want to talk about health care cost—a big issue, obviously. The Indiana Legislature is going to be looking at uh, is looking at several bills related to that. The Indianapolis Business Journal came out with a uh, a big opinion piece uh, recently talking about that. Senate Bill Eight, tightening controls on pharmacy benefit managers. Uh, there's also a bill to find hospitals that charge uh, uh, 200, more than 260 percent of Medicare reimbursements. Uh, your thoughts on bills being discussed at the Indiana State House? Yeah, you know, in general, we're pleased to see the legislature begin to take on some of these issues. You may recall, Gary, we spoke last year after my economic club speech that really was trying to get uh, policymakers to consider new factors in attracting and growing our economy, factors beyond tax rates and infrastructure, which we were very good at. Those include education and healthcare costs. We need a better educated work for workforce and we need lower healthcare costs in the state. That can come through a variety of means. One is healthier Hoosiers, we're all for that as well. But the other is a more efficient healthcare delivery system. And I think these bills are you know, taking a shot at improving the efficiency of our healthcare. That's good for business because that's one of our largest costs here. Um, but it's also, of course, good for our citizens to have a better functioning health care system. So we applaud those efforts. We don't have a particular view on each one of those things. But um, if they're aimed at lowering health care costs and improving the health of Hoosiers, uh, Lily's uh, all for it. Dave Ricks, the CEO at Eli Lilly and Company. Dave, really appreciate you taking the time. I know we'll be following uh, uh, your uh, travails in 2023, which promises to be a very interesting year. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Take care. Well, coming up next, Indiana's impact on global health. See how a Purdue affiliated company is making a big dent in providing safe food and water for those who most desperately need it.
Well, a national competition is named a biotech startup led by Boilermakers, one of the most fundable companies in the U.S. Business of Health reporter Kylie Valletta here now with more. Kylie. Well, that's right, Gary. Four Purdue engineers, three of them female, are the co-founders of Omniviz. 4,000 early stage companies entered the competition at Pepperdine University, and Omniviz is only one of 16 in the U.S. to be recognized as the most fundable. The startup says its handheld iSpy DX device puts the power of the lab in the palm of your hand. Omniviz will initially be targeting food processing facilities and manufacturers that can use the device to detect foodborne pathogens like E. coli in less than 30 minutes. Co-founder and CEO Dr. Catherine Clayton says the device requires no scientific training and is a lower price point than standard lab testing for food. The user puts a small sample inside a small disposable cartridge, which is inserted into the device. About 30 minutes later, it shows a positive or negative result. And the judges told Omniviz it stood out due to its impressive support network. And I think part of it is because we do come out of Purdue. That's a huge name school. We have just really great talent that's always coming out of the school there, um, whether it is engineering, which is kind of my background, or even now food science people that that have really been able to, to help with a lot of the vetting. Um, it's the amazing engineers we've had on the team over, over time. It's the advisors that we have. It's the directors that we've had. But being able to really leverage these amazing connections and amazing people who share the same excitement for what we're doing, I think they said that's a huge part that stood out for Omniviz. An article came out through TechCrunch that showed that only 1.9% of VC funding goes to, to females and female entrepreneurs. And so being able to leverage that we are a most fundable company and that you know women really should have half of that funding. They really should have more representation in, in VC funding and angel funding. Uh, I think that this is really reflective of that, of showing that women-led companies are strong. We create great returns for, for investors and six months of due diligence doesn't lie. The startup plans to open a seed round of funding very soon, followed by pilot testing with food processors, and next would be working toward regulatory approval and commercialization of the device. That's a great story. And, and you know, this recognition is, is big. This isn't your typical little weekend competition. No, right? not at all. And that was the first thing she said, is that this was a six-month intense vetting process. And so it really showed that they have the chops to be part of that mm -hmm. finalist list of 16. Mm -hmm. And she said the networking was also incredible. They really mm. expanded their network when they were out there. And that as a result of this competition and placing, they do have funders knocking on their door now. And, and interesting, too, Purdue is not, uh, uh, they've had this recognition yes. for startups at Purdue. Yes, Purdue is not a stranger to this mm -hmm. list. They have been on the list now of most fundable three years in a row. Wow. Last year it was another female-led uh, life sciences related company. And then the year before that, another Purdue connected company, Adranos. Yeah. And they went on after that competition. They did get funding to the wow. tune of yeah. $20 million. Big. Hey, quickly too, I know this this startup, she, she's got visions of doing a lot of stuff in Indiana, right? That's right. She says Indiana is such a great place to test this because mm -hmm. we have so many food processors and manufacturers so she wants to pilot test here and then she really wants to focus her hiring here in indiana as well she says lots of experts coming out of purdue yep. and other places that she's happy to hire yep. good stuff thanks kylie yep well coming up next why general motors is tapping the brakes on a massive multi-billion billion dollar ev battery plant in northern indiana is the deal dead or could it still happen and in this week's IBJ, a look at secret donations being made to universities in Indiana. What's behind the trend? Plus, know the code and you're in. How an Indianapolis bar is tapping into the speakeasy trend. Here's what's making news around Indiana, brought to you by the Indiana Association of Realtors, Indiana's 21,000 realtors, the neighbors you know, the experts you can count on. 
Well, already a lot of big stories, uh, business stories developing around the state to kick off 2023. Around Indiana reporter Mary Rachel Redman here now with the latest. Mary Rachel. Well, Gary, we start in northern Indiana and an update on a proposed massive EV battery plant there. The tiny village of New Carlisle, just outside of South Bend, has everything in line to build a $2.4 billion electric vehicle plant. But GM and LG Energy Solutions are tapping the brakes on the plans to build a fourth Ultium Cells facility in the U.S., like this one in Warren, Ohio. South Bend regional leaders, though, still confident they'll land the plant. What we've been told is if they're going to build a fourth plant, it likely will be here. So they don't, they're do not they not talking to other sites. They're not looking at other sites. They, you know, the, this is their site for a fourth plant. We're, we're pretty comfortable with the amount of time and the effort and the energy being expended here that, that you know, this will be the fourth plant. Stalio tells me they should hear final word on the decision in the next two to three weeks. If St. Joseph County does indeed land the plant, it would generate 1,600 jobs. While also making news around Indiana, check this out. The 2019 liftoff of the largest plane on Earth. The product of California-based Stratolaunch. Now the high-speed aerospace company is partnering with Purdue to accelerate the designing, building, and flying of more hypersonic vehicles. Stratolaunch will soon set up an advanced programs office at Purdue's Discovery Park. So just how fast do these aircraft go? Five times the speed of sound. Indiana's ag biosciences sector getting a big boost. Liberation Labs has tapped Richmond to develop its first biomanufacturing facility in the U.S. The company investing $115 million to build a fermentation facility there. Rolling the dice in South Bend, where the skyline is about to dramatically change with the opening of the new 23-story Four Winds Casino Hotel, expected to start hosting guests within the next few weeks. The town of Shearerville casting a line that won't just include fishing. The Northwest Indiana community moving forward with plans to create more liquor licenses to establish a downtown riverfront district. And just north of Shearerville, it's out with the old and in with the new for those who like to put down those sliders. The 88-year-old White Castle in Whiting to be torn down, replaced with a more modern version. And Gary, it's it's not just modern in appearance, but also technology. A number of White Castles across the country have started to use Flippy 2. Oh, it wow. is a robot that flips burgers. Nice. White Castle going high tech. Good stuff. Too. All right. Thanks, Mary Rachel. Well, the Business and Beyond podcast, we've hit a big milestone. Episode 100 with the one and only Dan Dockage. We're going to take a short break now over the next two weeks to recharge, gear up for season three. You should check out some of the really fantastic guests we've chatted with, from Mario Andretti to Angelo Pizzo to IU President Pam Witten. Two giant Indiana media personalities, Mark Patrick and Bob Kavoyan. Dearly beloved Ozier fans. <laughs> hey, Coach, how you doing? <laughs> bye, 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 I'll be nice. <laughs> Six, five, 200 or so. <laughs> This is the Bob and Tom Show. Hello. Bob and Tom, Bob and Tom. You can check out all 100 episodes of the Business and Beyond podcast at InsideIndianaBusiness.com. Well, Columbus-based Cummins has launched a new program at Arsenal Tech High School in Indianapolis. We'll explain how it will help deliver the workforce of the future. Well, in today's environment, technology impacts really every business. Don't miss IBJ's Technology Power Breakfast, February 15th. Our panelists will dive into key issues and emerging trends that will help uh, inform your tech strategy for the year ahead. RSVP by February 9th at IBJ.com slash events or you can scan uh, the QR code there on the screen for more information. It's time now for Eye on Education. Columbus-based Cummins has launched a new program in Indianapolis focused on skilling up students to address the technical skills gap 
in manufacturing. This week, Cummins and partners from Allison Transmission, Indigo and Indianapolis Public Schools held a ribbon cutting at Arsenal Tech to launch the new Technical Education for Communities, or Tech for short. In Indianapolis, there's a need for trained diesel mechanics. The program at Tech will focus on providing training for future diesel engine service technicians. This collaboration is really important for us at Cummins. One of our big global initiatives is this tech program. We operate schools in uh, 25 different schools around the U.S. in 12 countries around the world. So for this to be our fifth school here in the U.S. and our first here in Indianapolis is really, really exciting because this is where we're based. So we want to continue to invest in our students here in Indiana. The program at Arsenal Tech is the first in Indianapolis and is one of only five in the U.S. and uh, more than two dozen worldwide. Cummins establishes programs in locations around the world where it has existing facilities. Real estate students at the IU Kelly School of Business are getting real-world investment experience by launching a new private equity fund. The $4.2 million fund, called Sample Gates Management, LLC, has more than three dozen individual investors. IU says it is the largest raise for an undergraduate student-managed private equity real estate fund in the U.S. The students can manage sample gates year-round, including raising capital and making investments with an advisory committee. Ivy Tech Community College has named Amanda Harson chancellor of its campus in Madison. She previously served as vice chancellor of academic affairs and held the chancellor role on an interim basis since August. Noblesville getting a new $130 million state-of-the-art corporate campus. Bastion Solutions, a Toyota advanced logistics company, is moving its corporate headquarters from Carmel to Noblesville. A corporate campus and a major manufacturing facility will be built on 162 acres. Bastion Designs makes and installs conveyor systems, robotics, software, and other materials handling products. Bastion says it plans to create about 250 jobs over the next five years and relocate 400 employees to the Noblesville location. It's all the time we have for this week's edition of the show. It's been really an opening that commuters have been waiting for for a very long time. We're talking about this. We were there just a few weeks ago getting an update on the construction. And now finally, I-70 is open in both directions uh, between the north and south splits through Indianapolis. And hang in there, it's going to be a few months before I-65, that massive project there, reopens. NDOT says it should open by late spring. And uh, I know we're all looking forward to that. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm Gary Dick. Go out and make it a successful week.